Okay, so uh, good morning. So welcome to the second day of the sh short course. So before the class, I'd like to let you know that all the slides and video have been uploaded. All right, so actually you can just go to Google, for example, and search for SC for SC. This stands for short course for scientific computing. So if you look at this one, and then the very first link will lead us to the uh, web page of this course. So you simply pick up this one, and then you can go to the uh, course away site. And as you may see, so here you can look, see the video. It has, they have been uploaded to YouTube. So you can watch your courses in case you missed that, or you want to just refresh your memory. And all these slides and source course can be downloaded from this link. Okay, so here's uh, slides, and you can see everything here. And well, you can also get the source code to implement in yesterday's class, all right? So you got everything big up. So uh, this is the uh, website. So this course, again, will run the whole week from uh, 21st to 25th, from 9 a.m. to 11, I mean, 1 p.m. All right, so any questions? Is that okay? All right, so you have fun? Okay, all right, so I think it's Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the second day of the uh, uh, FMM uh, tutorial. Today, uh, yesterday, we discussed about uh, the basic uh, mathematics of the fast multiple method. But we didn't discuss too much about how to manipulate the tree structure. So today, we will discuss mostly about the tree structure. No, no, no equations today. So yesterday, we mentioned that we will divide the domain hierarchically into f four boxes, and then 16 boxes, and then so on. Um, and this, in terms of a linked structure, will look like this. So a tree structure, in, in computer science terms, is a structure that has a link from yourself to all your children, child nodes. We call each of these circles nodes or, or cells. So um, in, in each of, of the cells, we have uh, a list of child cells that it's connected to and also a link to the parent. So by pointing to the parent, you can actually retrieve the structure the next structure. So you can, you can follow the link. So it's like a linked list where you start from the top. You can either start from the top and follow the link down and down by following these links to the children. And each of these cells can contain like a multiple expansion coefficient. And the code we wrote yesterday, we had uh, only one Q. So Q, QJ prime. Uh, it was like the single multiple uh, that we used. And we didn't have uh, any high order terms. So it, it's just one double that we need to store in terms of the code we want to write uh, from yesterday. And so if we create the following structure in, in C language, we can actually manipulate these cell structures and do the calculation for the multiples we want. So basically, we, what we wanted to do yesterday was to sum all the child multiples. So we, we first call the child multi child and then access the multiples and sum them 
into the current multiple. I'll, I'll show you in today's um, hands-on session, we will do this kind of coding. So the equation we used yesterday, it's the same. It's just this time, instead of looping over ix, iy, iz, this time we'll do a more sophisticated way of accessing the cell structures. Also, there's a more uh, sort of indirect way of looking at the tree. And this is by using uh, an index that is numbered in a unique way. So either you can use Morton indexing is, has a shape. It's numbered like a Z curve. It's a space filling curve because the whole space can be filled by one curve. The curve is connected. It doesn't uh, get cut in any of the um, areas. It's just one line, one continuous line throughout the domain. That's why it's called a space filling curve. Now, the Hilbert curve is completely continuous, whereas the Morton curve sort of uh, it jumps like from 7 to 8. It goes across the domain. But it's still space filling because it, it fills, it only runs through each box once. So in that sense, it's a space filling uh, ordering. So the significance of both of these orderings is the following. So look at each number closely and say this division is an integer division. Uh, so like in, in C language or any like Fortran, if you divide by an integer, by another integer, it returns an integer. It doesn't uh, give you a floating point number. In, in MATLAB, this is different. But think, think of the case if you're writing this in C. So if you write like this, for these numbers, it will return 0. For these numbers, it will return 1. For these numbers, it will return 2. And for these numbers, it will return 3. So look at the parent numbering. So you, you, by doing this operation, you can get the parent. Same for this box. If you divide this by 4, you will always get 0. So by, by just dividing by 4, and in 3D, it's the same. Divide by 8, you can always get your parent number. See, same for here. Look at these numbers. If you divide these numbers by uh, 4, you will always get the parent number. And same, and again and again. So it's like a recursive structure that has uh, a relation between its parent like this. And so if you think of the other way, you can find all the children by multiplying by 4. So any of these indices multiplied by 4. And then you add a number C from 0 to 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. Any of those numbers will give you all the children. So instead of go doing it this way, where it has an explicit pointer to the cell structure of the parent, you can actually retrieve the index uh, of the parent or child cell and have the cell structure without these, just store a multiple in a long array. And you can manipulate the index of the parent, the child. So you can just directly index the multiple and access the parent one, the child one, by so you just have multiple i access uh, the child or the parent in this way. So th this is a totally different way of looking at the tree. So you can either have a linked tree structure or an index tree structure. So some people, some FMM codes use this one. Some FMM codes use this one. No, no one uses both, but it's uh, you know, useful to understand uh, the two ways of coding. And I'll come back to this two ways again and again in today's uh, lecture, because some concepts apply to this one, and some concepts apply to this one. So this is the basic structure of the tree. So this one, You're yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so the, the main advantage would be when you use this one for uh, partitioning in like a domain decomposition type uh, method. Once you start programming your fast multiple code in MPI, then you need to partition the domain. This one partitions um, into a continuous uh, structure. But this one jumps. So say that your partition included 8 and 7, and 6, and 5, and 4, then you have a jump here. And so your partition domain will have like a small island far away. 
And in terms of like communication uh, minimization, it's not good to have a small island far away because you, you, you need to communicate many things if you have a jump in your domain decomposition. So this one has less jumps. Uh, but so as I will mention in today's uh, lecture, this one is much more easy to comprehend and also code. This index is more intuitive. And the reason I will mention uh, immediately after this slide, but uh, this one, it, it's, uh, you know, well, you can, once you code uh, the function which can generate these numbers, then it's no, no longer a problem. It's just conceptually, this one is easier to understand, I think. Well, I, I'm not aware of this indexing. What what does uh, it do? In 2006, it was a JCP paper, Journal of Computational Physics paper, uh -huh. uh, fully threaded tree, where he made a quad tree type presentation okay. where every branch and every parent has a full uh, control to uh, divide the domain. I mean, we are not going for an indexing. We will go for a quad tree type uh, indexing. But is it does it still use indexing or does it is it this kind is it this type no, where it's use indexing. okay uh, but uh, uh, actually uh, that is somewhat uh, coupling both of these actually. I mean they use the uh, uh, index tree okay but they all, for every index tree they have a structure I mean uh, uh, I see well so the the um, the reason why I'm showing you this is because I want to start from the basics. Okay. So there are more advanced techniques that I will mention later in the, this lecture, maybe like a few days later. But uh, this one is the basic way to, to handle this. So um, just to describe a little bit more about the Morton indexing. So first, you can have um, the level one uh, sort of uh, uh, numbering, you can think of this as, uh, you know, in terms of bits. So see, e each of these bins represent one bit inside the integer that you're manipulating. So Morton indexing is actually um, numbering the bits according to if it's on this side or this side, the smaller side or larger side in each direction and for each level continuously. So that, that's all it is. So at the first level, level one, you, you decide whether your point is in which box by saying, if I look in the x direction, is it on the zero side or the one side? If it's on the one side, I number it one. And then in the y direction, I also decide if it's on the zero side or the one side, if it's on the larger side or not. And then I number it one. And then by putting these two contiguous numbers in the bit, actually this becomes these numbers here. It shows 0, 1, 2, 3. And then when I go to the next level, I actually shift these two bits. And shifting by two bits to the larger side is equal to multiplying by 4, right? In, in like a computer, you, you shift the bits this way tw uh, two times it's the same effect as multiplying by 4. And you can do this in C. You can actually do a bit shift operator, uh, shift two times, and then it will give you the same answer as multiplying by 4. Yeah, this is for integers. I'm talking about integers. Um, and that won't happen for floats. Okay? So w when, you're, when you're using integers for your calculation, this is actually the same effect as multiplying these numbers by 4, and then what you do is you add this next map, which is 0, 1, or 2, 3, inside each of these quadrants. So each quadrant you have divided, you decide again, is it on this side or this side? So now, let's, let's say we're looking at this box 12. So if we're looking at this box 12, we again decide which side is it on. When I, when I decide in this box here, in the x direction, it's on the 0 side. 
in the y direction, it's also on the zero side. So both numbers are zero. So we put those in. And then the number we have, 1100, zero, zero, in binary form, is actually 12 in decimal form. And then, again, we go to the next level. We multiply by 4, the actual number, but in... in, in level. Once we make the space, we decide again, looking at this small box here, it's a 0, 1, 2, 3. We decide if the x component is on the 0 side, the y component is on the 1 side. So we add 1 to the y and 0 to the x, which is the number 2. So it's the same as multiplying by 4, the 12, which is 48, and adding 2, which will give you 50. So this number is actually uh, interleaving the bits. This is called interleaving because you go x, y, x, y. Uh, and in three dimensions, you do x, y, z, x, y, z. You keep adding the one or zero decisions based on whether it's on the lower side or the higher side. So it's a binary operation that goes level by level, uh, z, x, or, yeah, z, y, x, z, y, x, z, y, x, in that order. So that will give you a unique index because the decision is always binary. You, you decide which side it's on. And so the number that you will finally arrive will be unique to, to that path of decision in the binary tree. And so you can number any part in space by using this index. And the good thing is you can do this without looking at the other parts. You, you, you can decide that my number is 50 without actually going through all these lower numbers to get to 50 because this is decided purely from your position. So if you knew the lower bound, the, the minimum value of your domain uh, in the x, y, and z direction, and if you knew the largest value, the, the maximum of your domain size, if you knew the bounds, then from the bounds, you can decide at each level, if it's on the zero side or the one side, is it on the left side or right side? Is it on the lower side or upper side? And by making these zero, one decisions, you don't need to look at other, you just need to know your coordinate and the bounds of the domain to decide this number. This is a very parallel operation because everyone can work without talking to anyone else. If I know the size of the domain, the bounds, and my coordinate, I can determine exactly this number index. So, that's uh, the useful feature about these space filling curve indices. And so once you get this number, now you need to use this number to find your neighbors and do find the interaction list, what, what is far and what is near. And to do that, it is useful to be able to um, go back and forth between this unique number and also this uh, sort of dimension-wise numbering. So like, if I can change 50 into 4, 5, which is like the two-dimensional coordinate. In 3D, you'll have three numbers to represent your um, coordinate. If you can change back and forth between these numbers, it's very useful. So this can be done by actually just taking out the x components, turning that into a number. This is 4 and then taking just the y components out, which is 1, 0, 1, for each level, and then turning that into a decimal, this is 5. So all you need to do is sort of uh, filter out all the x components and call that your x index. And this can be done very easily inside your code. You just need to take you know, every other or every third uh, number in 3D to get your uh, dimension-wise numbers. Once you get this number, finding your neighbor is very easy. See, you, all you need to do is subtract one and add one to get your left and right neighbors. You just need to uh, subtract one and add one to get your top and bottom neighbors. So um, neighbor finding becomes a, a very easy uh, manipulation. So let's say I want to find my neighbors of 26 and I'm given the Morton index 26, but nothing else. And I want to get these numbers, 13, 15, 37. So how do I get these numbers? It's done in the following steps. So 
first I have the number 26. I do this um, deinterleaving of the bits 26 to 3 and 4 by doing this operation here. I just take each of the components out and turn them into this two numbers. And this will tell me that 26 is actually 3 and 4. I will get this number from, I just call a function that generates these two numbers. Then from 3 to 4, getting the neighbors is looping over from minus 1 to 1 and sort of uh, looping around my 3, 4. So I go from 2, 3, and 4, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, and I have 4 in the center here. So I go from 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, and 3, 4, 5. These are my nine neighbor functions in the gray. So now I have this two-dimensional index. Now I need to turn this into back into this Morton index. And how do I inter interleave the bits? It's the uh, reverse operation of what I'm doing here. So I just um, put these numbers back into like the y, x, y, x, y, x order and call that my Morton index. And by doing that, I will get these numbers. And now I can just use this number to access any cell. I can just do index 13, get what's inside box 13 by using this one index. So you can do all these uh, manipulations by going back and forth between like a three-dimensional or two-dimensional index and the Morton index. And this is uh, a nice way to uh, get the neighbor lists. OK, so how do you build the tree? So first, you, need, you have a, a bunch of points, and you don't have a tree. You need to first create the tree to do all those manipulations. So again, I, I'll, I'll show you how to do it for the linked version and also the indexed version. So for the linked version, what you do is, first step, you start from the entire box. So you need to have uh, a, a big box in the beginning. And you start to add your points. And as you add them, you reach a certain number of points per box, right? And the, as I mentioned yesterday, the key is to have a constant number of points per box. So once it reaches a certain threshold, say 32, once you have more than 32 points in this box, and you're always counting how many I've added, um, and then you, you subdivide once it reaches this number. And once you subdivide, you determine which quadrant or octant your, your particles belong to. So you go again counting for each box how many you have. And you keep adding more points. You keep adding the coordinates of your x, y, and z um, particles. And as you keep adding, uh, you'll, uh, again, reach a point where this number reaches more than 32. And then you split that one. And then you, you sort of count again and again. And when you split, you do the following operation to get your pointers pointing to your child and parent. So this is the parent. Um, ah, the, the, these are the children. So say that the parent is called C0, cell 0. Cell number 0 is the big box, blue box here. And the, the children are the red boxes here. So cell number one and two, let's say, are these child boxes. And so the child number zero of the blue cell number zero is cell number one. So you make a point to this. And then child number one uh, is pointed to two. And then again, you do the other side. So cell number zero should be pointed by the ch child number one's parent pointer. So the, if you say parent, it will point to this blue box. And same for the cell number two. Parent will point to this. So you do these um, assignments to the child and parent pointers. And then you can access them any time from after this. And so you keep uh, adding uh, more cells to your tree by following the links. And once it reaches more than a certain number of points, you, add, you keep adding. And another useful um, number to add here is like the begin and end index of the points that you've been adding. So 
every time you add a point, um, you, you keep the index that you've um, added. So you're, you're adding, you're starting from zero, and then let's say you add to like number 50. So if you added 50 points in this cell, then your starting point is zero, and then this end pointer should be 50, and then you can access um, any of the elements inside the, the box, the cell, by referencing these integers because you've stored um, what's inside your box. So, so this is uh, the way you do it if you want to create a link tree. So now with this structure, you can access any of your parents, your child's, um, and your particles that are inside your box. But you can't access directly your neighbors. So um, I'll, I'll talk about how you access your neighbors in this type of um, uh, linked tree structure. But for now, um, I'll, I'll go to the indexed version and say how you do the initial tree construction for the indexed um, list. So zero, um, th these numbers, I told you, can be assigned to each coordinate without looking at the other one. So what you do is, for each point, you just calculate the number in the beginning. Before you do anything, you just say, this point, where is it? What's the number? So these, this one is here. It belongs to 2, so I number it 2. So this one, I say 1. It belongs to 1. And initially, these points, if I generate them with a random number generator, they could be going like, you know, here is the first one, this could be the second one, this could be the third one, and this could be the fourth one. So it could go 2, 1, 2, 0, right? It could be in any random order. And so I just, I don't care. I just number them, and I put the numbers in the array that has the same size as the number of, of points here. And so I just put them in a long array and store all the integers, the Morton index, in a big long array. And then what I do is, I sort uh, these numbers so that they become continuous. And what happens then is you're actually grouping all these points so that they become continuous inside each box. So after you do this sort, you are actually, um, so, so when you move these integers, you also move uh, the, the corresponding x, y, and z in the same order so that they become this, this order instead of this for, you know, the original order. Then what you can do is you just need to have the offset, say, where box 0 starts from in terms of the index of the points. So it starts from 0. The offset for the box number 1 starts from 1. So you can access all the bodies inside cell number 1 by start looping from 1. You can access all the bodies inside cell 2 by starting from number 3 and um, looping until offset of the third box. Because the offset of the third box is right after the end of the, the second box. So these numbers can be used as the start point and end point of, of the bodies, the number of the, the particles that you want to access. So the key was this sorting part. Without the sorting, you can't have this, just the offset, uh, be uh, indexed to um, retrieve all the bodies. Because the bodies are in random order. You can't retrieve all of them uh, by just one number. But if they're sorted, you can retrieve all the bodies inside the cell by just one number because you know that they're contiguous and how many there are from the difference between the two offsets. So that's how many there are. So by, by just storing, so all you need to do is two operations. You do a sort, and then you do like a scan uh, uh, to j get like a prefix sum operation to get all the offsets of these numbers. So uh, the, the type of codes that manipulate the indices always have some kind of sorting algorithm in the beginning. So in, in like a serial calculation, it, it's quite trivial. In, in a parallel calculation, you need to have a parallel sort. So it, it's more of a, a headache. But for, for today's hands-on, 
uh, I would like to do this this um, practice, um, and you can just use the the standard, you know, the the sort algorithm that's already available inside, you know, C. So <laughs> you don't need to write your own sorting technique. You just need to call a function called sort. Um, it's already prepared in the math uh, kernels. So uh, we can have um, this kind of index manipulation and generate all these points and we will see uh, how Sir, yes in index tree we can sort the neighbors easily oh yes this this one yeah. yes we we can search the neighbors easily by doing this this kind of so that is the main advantage for index tree uh okay. there, there are other advantages too but um I, I will mention the advantages and disadvantages once we move to the adoptive tree structure. So for, for the full tree, there's not really um, any disadvantages for using uh, these um, index-based okay. structures. But the people that have more uh, adoptive trees, which means non-uniform distributions of points, they tend to use linked lists, and there's a reason for this. But I'll explain this in like the latter half of my today's morning lecture. So, um, yeah. Uh, but uh, so now that I've explained what the structures are, I will be able to tell you. From yesterday's lecture, we saw um, the calculations that we need to do. Are first, we need to loop over all the points and sum their effects into one multiple expansion at the center of the cell. So this kind of calculation we can do by, in this case, the link tree. We have the begin and end uh, indices, so we just loop over that. And then the M2M, uh, the multiple expansion of the small cell to the larger cell, can be done by indexing the parent and looping over all the cells and just keep indexing the parent and summing to the parent. Um, the other way around, if you want to do the local um, expansion of the large box to the local expansion of the small box, we just need to keep adding um, the local expansions. In, in this case, in yesterday's lecture, we had ui equals ui prime. So that's, that's this part here. We're just keep adding to the ui, local ui. And then once you reach the bottom, you do ui equals um, the UI prime thing by looping over again all the points inside that cell because we have this start and end index. Then on the index tree side, I mentioned you can have the offset being the loop counters for accessing all the points inside that tree structure, the leaf structure. So you just loop over from offset 0 to 1 and 1 to 2 for all the different cells. And then you can accumulate the multiple in the same way. This is all about accessing the bodies, the parents, and the children inside your cell. These three things are all you need to access. And so for the parent, you just had to divide by 4 to get the parent index. And so you say, my index i needs to be added to parent p index by dividing by 4 and just adding. And similarly, you can just keep adding to your child cell. Uh, by having a loop that goes, so this number, is, it says 1 here, but this can loop over from 0, 1, 2, and 3, and you can add to all the four child cells in your um, cell. And then at the end, again, you loop over the offset, starting from uh, offset 0 to 1 for uh, cell number 0, and 1 to 2 for cell number 1, and so on, and to add to the UI in each cell. So now you have the capability to do P2M, M2M, L2L, and L2P. The, the thing that's missing is the part where you need to find the neighbors. I'm uh, intentionally skipping that part from this slide because that part is a bit more complicated. I, I mentioned a little bit about how to do it on this side, how to find the neighbors, but um, explaining that is the, the second part uh, of my lecture. I think this is the end of my first part. So. Uh, maybe if, if I'm going fast, uh, maybe I should just continue uh, because then we can have more time for the hands-on, right? That would be better. So, okay, maybe I can finish everything in the first 
uh, 50 minutes, and then we can have three sessions of hands-on today. OK, so I, I mentioned uh, the neighbor finding uh, can be done by first deinterleaving the bits, and then finding the neighbors with the two-dimensional index, and then interleaving them back. So when, when you do this, uh, you, you do the following. So first, uh, ah, sorry. So this is how to relate the neighbor finding to actually finding these red boxes for each blue box. So yesterday, I explained for the multiple expansion to local expansion translation, you need to find the far interaction boxes. So which one is far, you need to detect. And the definition of being far is non-neighbor. So if you can find your neighbor, you can find these red boxes by definition, right? So the first operation is to find your parent because what you want to do is first you want to find your parent's neighbors, okay? So in each operation, you find your parent. So if the blue box is the box you're currently looking at, then your parent is this big green box. For this case, it's this big green box. And for this case, it's this green box here. This is your parents. Then, for each level, you look at your neighbor. So what is the neighbor here? My neighbors are this one, this one, and this one. I don't have anything on this side, so I just need to look at these three boxes here. Uh, in this case, I need to look at these eight boxes, which are my neighbors. And then, in this case, I need to look at the eight boxes, which are my neighbors. And the way to look at neighbors, we know. We can do this operation here and to find all these numbers around me. Then what I do is once I access my neighbor boxes, which are these big ones, I look at their children, which means all these red boxes. But it includes not just the red boxes, but it includes also these white parts too, because it's just the children. I haven't said non-neighbors yet. So I'm looping over potentially all these boxes that are red and both white, red and both white. I'm looping over all these boxes. And again, I'm looping over all these boxes that are both red and, and white. And then, and then I do this, I can write an if statement saying, when I'm looking at all these boxes, just operate when they're not my neighbors. And, and I can do that by, again, I have the index of all these numbers here. Right? I, so when I, when I look at the children, I, I get the child indices by doing this calculation. So when I call a function, let's say, called non-neighbor of my child index, I'm actually inputting, again, some index of the child cell. So when each child cell gets this index, it does a similar operation like this. It, it turns it into a 2D index. And then once you have the 2D index of the blue box and the red boxes, you can compare them and say, if, if they're um, more than one apart, then it's okay, right? So you compare three, four. Let's say I'm looking at three, four, and maybe this is close enough to three, four. So if I'm looking at three, four, and this number I was looping over um, that said child cell told me it was one and four, like, like uh, this one. Then it's OK. If it said it's 2 and 4, then it's right next to 3, 4. So I can say it's too close and not use it for the calculation. So I, I have something that is looping over all the children. There's a loop that's looping over all the neighbors and then all the children inside those neighbors. So there's like a double loop happening already. Inside that loop, I need to write something that says, um, first, deinterleave the bits of your red box and blue box, and then compare the two-dimensional index each, e in each direction and see if it's more than minus one or uh, less than minus one or more than plus one to, to say that it's safely outside of this neighbor region. That, that's all you need to do. And then you can, for each, if you do this operation, parent, neighbor, child, non-neighbor, if you do this operation again and again, then you can get all these red boxes that are needed for each blue box. And since all of this can be done by manipulating the index, 
you, you, you can just do a lot of um, operations on you know, just the index to, to find your parent, to find your neighbor, to find your child, uh, to find your non-neighbors. So everything is done by comparing integers here. So if, sometimes if you make a mistake in, in your code, um, you, you end up indexing a box that doesn't exist or you, you get some strange index. Uh, so you need to be careful when you manipulate index um, in, in any code because the most common bug is your index could be out of bounds, right? And manipulating indices is not something uh, you want to do unless it's entirely necessary. Usually um, codes that prohibit you from doing this have less bugs, but in this case, you really need to manipulate your index. So, you know, f for, for, for those of you that are coding in C, it's not really a problem. C lets you manipulate your indices however you want. So, um, if you're using things like C++ iterators, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because they don't let you directly manipulate in, um, iterators like, like this, but um, you can still do it. So, uh, you, you can form the M2L part um, interaction list by doing this operation. So now you know how to do all the components. You, you, know, you know how to do P2M, M2M, L2L, L2P, and a bit more complicated but still possible, you can do this operation, M2L operations. And so as I mentioned in yesterday's lecture, this, this part could be potentially uh, the most time-consuming part also in the FMM, um, other than the direct part that you do for the innermost calculations. So, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you, you can do the direct part by just doing a simple neighbor search. So if you can find your neighbors, that's, that's where you do the direct part, of the P2P operation on. So uh, now you have all the components and you can potentially write uh, FMM code with the in index uh, tree uh, version. So um, in today's hands-on, we will first try to construct a tree, check that your tree is correct by uh, printing the index of, of your uh, boxes, and then once you are sure that your index is okay, we'll try to access, so uh, things like accessing the parent, accessing the child, accessing the neighbor can be done um, in a very s simple way. Um, first, the correctness of your code um, for the, the P2M and M2M part is very easy to check. So yesterday we said QJ, the, the charges of all your points was one. So if you had n points, the final parent at the top should be the sum of all of them. So it should be one times the number of points you have in the whole domain. So if that number is correct, then you, that means you have correctly coded P2M and M2M. And you have correctly coded the parent finding and the offset finding and the sorting. So all of these things you can confirm already by just one test, you check if the, the root multiple value is uh, n, basically. If, if all your charges are 1, the sum should sum to the number of points in your, your entire domain, which is n. So you can do a very simple check to correct, check that it's correct. And then if that one is correct, it's quite likely that these, the symmetric side of going down the tree um, is also correct. So then you can move on to this neighbor finding. And, and this is also quite easy to check. So uh, because we know in this picture, and today we'll code everything in 2D because um, it, it's a bit easier if you don't have to manipulate three numbers um, and you can just do it with two. So today uh, we'll code everything in 2D. And so we will look at this table and we will actually try to do this exact case. We will try to find the neighbors of 26 in our today's hands-on session. And so we will write a code that deinterleaves the bits and turns 26 into 3 and 4. It outputs two numbers. 
And then we will find the neighbors and then make sure you can interleave them back into these numbers. Once everyone has this code that can do this one, then it's only one more step until you can do this one. Because you have all the components. You have how to find parents, and you have validated that in the first test. Um, and then you can find your neighbors, you can find the children, and then this non-neighbor finding part is the only uh, challenge uh, you need to add to this final uh, version. Once you have all of these, you have all the kernels, so potentially by the end of today's hands-on session, you will have a full, complete um, FMM code that works. Um, and so the, the accuracy issues, so I, I want to spend a little more time on the hands-on sessions because there's one thing we haven't coded yesterday that um, I, I, I wanted to, which is the other, the other slide. So um, let me pull up yesterday's slide. Oh, sorry. So yesterday's slide, we had the high order expansions. So th this thing, this thing we haven't coded yet. So once we have all these equations, then it becomes, you know, a complete fast multiple code. So, but this is sort of optional because I don't know if we have enough time. This, this is a bit more complicated. But once you have this one, you can control the accuracy. So uh, you, you have much more proper um, fast, multi you have a much more proper fast multiple method. And, and uh, yeah, so if we have time, I want to change what you're calculating inside each of your functions into these. But these can be done after you have the whole tree. And I think it should be in that order because this could be a bit complicated. OK, so now um, going back to the interaction lists. OK, so we're almost done with uh, interaction lists. I, I just wanted to mention, um, so I mentioned how you can find this interaction list in the index tree by manipulating indices, parent, neighbor, child, non-neighbor, OK? Um, I didn't mention how you do it for the link tree version. So this is how. Uh, it, it's a bit more complicated, but I, I tried to make it in a, into a picture so you can see what actually happens. So it's done through something called a dual tree traversal. You traverse uh, two trees, one for the J, and one for the i. So let's call this one the source tree, the j tree, and the target tree, the i tree. So you have two points, j, the, the source side, and i, the target side. And for you want to find inside these tree, there are a pair of blue and red nodes or cells that satisfy this kind of criteria. You just need to find them. So how do you find them? You, you start out from the root node of both trees, and you, you, put, push, you, know, you, you can push them into like a stack. You can store them into like an array of a bunch of pairs, blue, red and blue box pairs. You start out from just one pair. There's nothing else. But then what you do is you take the pair that's at the top. Here you have only one. So in the beginning, you just take this one. You, you subdivide one side. So let's say you subdivided the red side, and then you had like four boxes now on the red side. And then for each of those boxes that you've subdivided, because each of these boxes has a pointer to its child, so you can loop over the child on the one side. And compare, you do the following comparison. You say, are these two boxes close enough and far enough? So uh, if you're starting from the top, of course, they're, they're the same cell, so it's too close to, to do this interaction. But once you start dividing, you reach a point where it's sort of in this region. It's, um, if they're neighboring, you, you, don't, you don't do the calculation. You push them back into the stack. 
So by definition, if, if you're popping them from the stack at some point, it's assured that they're non-neighbors at the parent level. Because once you divide them into children, you check if they're neighbors. If they're, if they're non-neighbors, you do the calculation. If they're neighbors, which means it's inside this circle, then you push them back into the stack so they get divided again. So that means everything that's pushed into this stack is not a neighbor. So you satisfy this parent's neighbor criteria